So I have a wonderful uh, new film coming out uh, soon uh, called A Call to Spy. And the director is Lydia Pilcher. And it was uh, produced by Sarah Megan Thomas. And she actually is an actress in the, in the show as well, she, in, the, in the film. She's the main actor in it. And I, she's such a go-getter, Sarah Megan Thomas. She created this whole thing for herself and she hired Lydia Pilcher to direct it. And we shot it in Philadelphia and then part of it in Budapest. And it's about the first Muslim female radiographer that went across enemy lines during World War II. And there's a statue to her heroism that's in London. And such a fascinating story. And her mother was a uh, white American and her father was a, um, a, 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 a Sufi uh, priest. And so, uh, and there's this beautiful uh, Indian girl, Radhika Apte, who plays uh, the other lead. And it's a fascinating story, really well done, very beautiful. And uh, my role is very small, but I'm very proud to be a part of it. So that's coming soon in September. Awesome. And uh, if you'd like to check out my interview on Mupo and Friends, it'd be great to see you there. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Mupo and Friends. This is Hollywood, and we are here with your host, Michelle Mupo, and my lovely co-host, Heather Hernandez. We have a very special guest today for you, a seasoned actress, a veteran in the entertainment industry, whose background is incredible. She's got quite a repertoire of awards, nominations. You've seen her on stage. You've seen her in television, popular Hollywood films, and she is currently turning heads for her incredible portrayal of a ruthless, cunning KGB agent in the NBC hit series, The Blacklist. Please welcome Lila Robbins. Hi, Lila. Hi, Lila. Hi, Lila. How are you? We're very exciting. <laughs> very Welcome. Nice to see all of you. <laughs> you too. You too. It's great to have you on here. Thank you for taking the time to come chat with us. Yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, you're originally, you're, are you coming to us from St. Paul, Minnesota, or are you oh, back in New York now? Uh, actually, no. I was visiting my mom uh, where I grew up in St. Paul, Minnesota. I was there for the last three weeks. I'm taking as much time with her as I can during these, you know, days of non-work. Uh, but I had to come back uh, yesterday and quarantine for two weeks because Minnesota is one of the states that's on the list for coming back to New York. So I have to quarantine for two weeks and I'll start shooting the blacklist, hopefully. They've been, they've been postponing getting going because they're trying to work out all the protocols with COVID. But I think we're going to give it a go October 1st. So. Yay, we're excited. Yeah. We're excited <laughs> to see more and where it goes. I want to start with... Uh, what you were raised in Minnesota, correct? You're, you you had come from a wonderful family. Your father was a chemist. You have three sisters. Your mom. How do they feel about uh, your your career? Were they uh, were oh, they in the industry as well? Where are you uh, uh, from? An industry family? No, not at all. No, my parents are immigrants from Latvia, and they left during uh, World War II. They escaped Latvia. And then they lived in a displaced persons camp in Germany in an American run displaced persons camp over there for five years. And then they came to America. They were sponsored by a church in Washington state in Seattle. And uh, they were migrant workers for a while. They, they picked broccoli for $5 a day. My mother hates that I keep telling the broccoli <laughs> story, but it kind of works. <laughs> um, they picked broccoli for $5 a day. And then my father got the chance to go to University of Washington and became a doctor in chemistry and then moved the family to St. Paul where he worked for 3M and he invented 48 things for 3M. He has 48 patents. Wow. wow. That's incredible. Wow. Yeah. Wow. And, and uh, my last name Robbins is actually uh, pronounced Ruabinch, but it's spelled just like Robbins. So it Ruabinch. Ruabinch. Oh, you said that very well. Ruabinch. Ruabinch. You have some Eastern European uh, roots yourself? <laughs> I, you know, I just got my, uh, my report for my uh, ancestry report, but I have oh. it. I have, it's, it's in the process of being made right now. Oh, so okay. we'll find out. I'll let but you know. But you had excellent pronunciation. And my sisters, I think I lucked out with the name. My sisters are Baiba, Dinah, and Zyga. Wow. And my niece is Kaya. 
I love Kaya. I love that name. Kaya. Um, now, I know you take care of your mother. Did you ever have to turn down anything because taking care of her or? Oh, no, I don't. I'm not full time taking care of my mom. Um, I've got a sister there who lives in St. Paul. Uh, but in the last couple of years, we've been trying to sort of tag team a bit more. So when I visit, she goes back to our childhood home and we hang out there. But then when I leave, she goes to my sister who lives about two miles away. So we're kind of in a rotation right now just so that she's not alone during COVID and, um, and uh, you know, she's slowing down a lot. So uh, I've been there a lot this year. I was doing a lot of shows in Toronto. Uh, I was doing Handmaid's Tale and the boys up in Toronto. So I would go up to Toronto work and then zip down to St. Paul and then zip back to New York into this little triangle a lot this year. So I could be with my mom. You have quite an extensive theater background, and uh, but you you love love theater, and you, I know you received your undergrad at the University of Wisconsin uh, Eau Claire, if I'm mm-hmm. pronouncing it correctly, mm-hmm. and uh, you played uh, the lead role in West Side Story of Anita and Man of La Mancha, Mama Rose, yep. and uh, <laughs> w- that that was before, and then you moved to New Haven, Connecticut, attended Yale School of Drama. Um, was that a, this? Was that a formative time for you? Yes. I mean, when I was in Eau Claire, I studied music. I studied classical piano. I really wanted to be Joni Mitchell. I would just wanted to be a, a singer songwriter. But then I realized I didn't really write songs. So I guess that wasn't going to happen. <laughs> and I was sort of lonely practicing the piano. So I'd sneak down to the theater department and got a lot of experience. But I knew that when I finished uh, undergraduate, that I knew that I, I'd had a lot of opportunities, but I didn't really feel like I had a technique or a way of analyzing scripts or really understanding some other aspects of, of acting. And so I was really, really wanted to go to grad school and get my MFA and just lucked out and getting into Yale. There were seven girls and 10 guys in my class. And I just think it's the best. I was one of the most uh, life-changing um, days when I got into the Yale. And I was a little grass seed from, you know, the Midwest and everybody else seemed very sophisticated. And some of the actors in my class had already been to New York and tried their, their hand, you know, at professional theater and were coming back to get their training. And I just, I just loved being there. And I had a lot of great teachers and I had a lot of great classmates that I learned from a lot too. What was your most valuable experience um, at Yale? Um... Well, generally, it was, uh, you mean just one, like one thing? That sure. I had, a, I had a wonderful movement teacher, Wesley Fada, who is still a dear friend of mine. And he always said, the body never lies. And we learned to sort of get the tensions out of our body so that our emotions could come out. Because a lot of times when you're, when you're growing up, things happen to you and you shut down and certain parts of your body shut down. And he helped us work through that so that our instrument would be really free to express ourselves. And I had a great uh, voice teacher, Zoe Alexander, who taught uh, the Kristen Linklater technique, freeing the natural voice. And that was wow. a really uh, powerful lesson for me. I was doing Electra with Patricia Clarkson was Electra and I was Clytemnestra, her mom. And we worked a lot on our voice in that project. And I had this really intense session where we were talking about mothers because it's all about mothers and daughters. And I was lying on the ground and the voice teacher was, Zoe was working with me and I literally, my whole face just like went numb and my tongue swelled up and I was having this like reaction to talking about the text in this really, we were breathing through it. So I've, I had a lot of sort of um, physical breakthroughs, I guess, as far as my instrument and also learned a lot about, um, how to approach a script as far as analysis or backstory or building a character. I just, I just really enjoyed my time there. I like school. I'm kind of a school person. I like school. <laughs> Do you teach as well? You, you teach theater? I have taught. I, I, um, I've taught at HB Studio, which is Uta Hagen's school, Herbert Berghoff school. What I, was it like working with her? Uh, I first worked with her, and then they invited me to teach there. She was great. I played her daughter twice. I did a play called The Silver Fox. And then I did a play called Mrs. Klein, which we did for nine months at the Lucille Hortel in New York. And then we toured. And she didn't teach me that. I mean, we were real colleagues. She was really, really good about not, you know, directing me as a fellow actor. But just being around her, I learned so much. And then they invited me to teach there. And I've taught there on and off. Most recently, I taught last year there with a, an actor named Frank Wood. We taught a class uh, in Chekhov. 
and we taught together because some, sometimes we'd get gigs and have to go and then somebody could be there when the other person couldn't. And I've also uh, done a lot of uh, one-on-one uh, coaching in my living room where I am right now. And I uh, coach young actors to get ready for grad school auditions or to just get up on their Shakespeare or you know a TV audition, really helping them get off the page and you know breathe and also you know a lot of that sort of coaching has to do with getting someone to relax and to find a way into their relaxation before they go into the audition so i really enjoy doing that i really love working with young actors and getting them to you know change and grow and it's just wonderful to feel you know that kind of eureka moment that happens it's just really satisfying i really love it i That's can beautiful. see the passion <laughs> yes, yeah. definitely. I, I know everybody wants to know about Blacklist. So oh. uh, I, I have to ask you, what was, okay, so you're in the seventh season and your first day, what was it like meeting James Spader? Like, was he nice? Was he? Oh, he was totally great. I was in the last episode of season six and that's where okay. my character is revealed. And it was a scene that we shot down in the village and they made this little street called Gay Street. It's down in the West Village. And they, it's one block long and they made it look like a Parisian street with these, they put these lamp posts and they wet down the sidewalk and I'm walking along and James Spader's character, you know, stops me. And I turn around and the first thing I had to do was walk up to him and kiss him. Oh. And I, I don't know, is a spoiler <laughs> alert? I don't know if people want to know. <laughs> It's and, okay. We've, we've, we're, oh. I spoiled alert completely researching <laughs> on you. <laughs> no, I saw the kiss and, and you know. Oh. Yeah, we see, I, it was a I, great I scene. It, and I got to tell you, I was like, wow, she got to kiss him. Because like when we were, when I was growing up, I had the biggest crush on him. So. I'm getting a little hot talking about kissing James. <laughs> <laughs> well, the best part about the scene was uh, there, there was a lot more to it. You, you kissed him and then you, you had to stab him. Yes. Right. Yes. So, right. Uh, but he was so lovely. We met on the set, on the street. We met for the first time. And he literally was like, it was like, okay, we're going to go by the numbers. You're going to walk up. You're going to say this line. Then we're going to kiss. You know, we just talked through it all, like really by the numbers. And he's a so real, talented. A real, real gentleman, so talented. So he's one of the producers on the show. I mean, he's, he's very involved in all of the aspects. I had a dress on, but he had a, a, a coat. He thought, oh, no, no, she needs to have a coat. So they got a, they were, you know rustled up a coat and he was involved in every aspect of it. He was really very in charge, and um, but really lovely and really funny and sweet and you know I've done I don't know how many episodes did I do last year, but I have only had a couple of times working with him, so I really I haven't gotten to know him really uh, so much as a you know as a person. I mean nobody really socializes in, on the on the cat in the cast but um i always feel really happy to be there and i always feel like he's got his eye and everything and i feel like i'm in really good hands when i'm working with him i was going to ask what you had had learned from from working on that set from the other actors uh mm. james spader uh yeah megan 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 um, megan boone she she <laughs> plays your daughter that's a really yeah. interesting dynamic in in the characters Tell us yeah. about, about uh, Katerina Rostova and uh, <laughs> what, is, what is her dichotomy? Well, I mean, I'm not real, I've signed a non disclosure, so I can't okay. really talk about all aspects mm -hmm. of Katerina. Uh, in fact, when I got the job, I, I talked to the producers and they gave me the whole backstory. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so I'm sworn to secrecy. But um, it's interesting because I get a lot of feedback from people that, oh my God, she's evil incarnate and all this. And, and I always joke, oh no, she's just terribly misunderstood. <laughs> because, uh, you know, everyone has their reasons. And I guess my job as an actress is to figure out the reasons that compel her and motivate her to do the things she does, you know, as crazy and, and spooky as they are. Uh, I have to be very grounded in feeling very justified in um, the actions that I take. And I, I love playing her because she is very, um, you know, she has many faces. She's very complex. She's very duplicitous. One second she's this, another second she's that. And that's really fun to do, you know. I, I tend to play a lot of sort of <laughs> scary ladies. <laughs> it's amazing. Right? You're though. quite fierce. <laughs> I've always wondered, like, why, why do we have all these jobs where I'm, like, so intense and, 
and sometimes rather mean and things. Um, I don't know. I, I, I think they're more fun. You know, I really enjoy getting those jobs. They're, it, it's, it's, it's very hard juicy. to do. It's very hard to do. You are an absolutely amazing actress. So obviously you, I, I mean, I'm sure they just said, Hey, we want her for the part. You didn't, am I correct? They picked you. They had to have. Yeah, I didn't. I, it was an offer. So it was really, exactly really because wonderful. you're, you're amazing. Like you, That's, uh, it's just wonderful to get offers. You know, you go through years and years and years of auditioning and trying to be, you know, what they're looking for and all second guessing everything. And it's just, it's just much nicer when they just offer you the job. What about Homeland? Was that, was that? That was an audition. That was an audition. And I auditioned at my agents. I read with uh, one of the assistants there who was running the camera. And I was on my way to Europe, actually. I was like leaving the next day. And my agent was, can you come in and throw yourself on tape for this? And as I left the taping, I was like, well, I guess we won't be hearing from those people. <laughs> <laughs> and I got to Europe and I got a call. Um, I was in Paris with friends and I'm at a restaurant. I get a call telling me that I got the job and I was so excited because it was very exciting. Down South Africa, Cape Town, South Africa for five months, which was such an adventure. And uh, it, it was a trip of a lifetime. It was really amazing. And uh, in my free time, I got to go on safari and things like that. It was really, really cool. Amazing so you, friends there too. You come so far, but when you moved to Hollywood, uh, your first Hollywood film was Planes, Trains, and Automobiles. Like, that's a classic. Um, yeah. What was your uh, experience like working in that film with Steve Martin and John Candy? Well, it was, uh, I'd only done one other film before that. I'd done a small independent film with Terry Kinney and Kevin Anderson in Mexico. And so this was my second film ever. And it's my first Hollywood film. And um, they flew me out there. And John, uh, John Hughes didn't like the set they had built for our house. And he kind of went, no, I don't like this set. We're going to rebuild it. So they sent me home for a week. Then I came back and they were very over budget and, and very behind week wise. So we shot for a week. But a lot of my stuff was just home alone, you know, answering the phone. Mm -hmm. And I worked one day with John Candy and Steve Martin, which was really nice. They were both really lovely. And they made me really comfortable. Um, I was, of course, terrified, you know, because this was all <laughs> very big for me. Uh, and I had to do scenes with, you know, children, little children that, oh, here are your kids, you know. <laughs> build a relationship in two seconds and film it you know it was all very new for me all of that whole process was very new and i was flying by the seat of my pants and um and of course when i went to see the film i was sort of devastated that so much of me was on the cutting room floor so to speak um because you know when you got john candy steve martin and me you know you're gonna cut me <laughs> <laughs> I wonder if they have any of that saved. <laughs> I don't know. Oh, my goodness. The outtakes. Yes, the outtakes. Of I guess if you were there to pick them up off the floor, huh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. See, this is the thing that dates me. People you know, don't even know what that means on the cutting room floor. Back in the day, people. Film I know, I know what it means, so <laughs> I'll, 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 I'll date myself with floor. you. <laughs> Like, yeah, like the old cut and paste. You actually <laughs> yeah. use cut and paste. <laughs> actually, literally, yes. yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but that was a lot of fun. And, um, you know, and it's, it's wonderful that it's a classic and people enjoy it every year. And uh, it's hilarious. It still is hilarious. <laughs> yeah. so it really works. It really works. Moving to Hollywood was quite different for you from, uh, from the theater life that you had. What, what is it like uh, preparing for a role in television and film as opposed to preparing for a role in the theater as an actress? Well, in the theater, you know, you have the, you have the advantage of, of weeks of rehearsal and time for things to gestate and for you to change your mind or let something sink in and develop and change. And I'm always astounded at, you know, incredible film or screen performances because you don't rehearse, you know, you, you show up and you, you got to hit your marks and you got to get all the props. You got to figure out what you're doing and then you've got to be, have it smooth. You know, I, I, I work my lines a lot because I find that I have more freedom. The, the more I really know them 
and can play with them in different ways, once I get to the set, then I've got all the freedom in the world as long as I'm really on it. So right now, you know, for Blacklist, I'm, I'm studying, studying, and I like to study them uh, while I'm like on an elliptical machine or walking. I find that if I physicalize uh, the process, the words go into me on a deeper level. Yeah. Instead of, you know, you can know your words lying in bed and think, oh, I got these lines. But you start moving around and things are happening and suddenly, you know, it gets a little more difficult. So I really like to, to pound them. And also, you know, you have to work on your own backstory. I'm not going to get there on the set and discuss all these things. Often the director doesn't have time for that sort of thing. So you really have to be prepared with all of that um, the, day, the day you show up. So it's, it's challenging. Um, I'm going to be doing a project, a mini series called Dr. Death. Uh, and I have, uh, I believe I have six out of eight episodes on that. And I don't know when it'll shoot, but I'm, I've got all the, all the scripts and I'm just learning all the lines and Dr. Death. Wow. You know, it's it's oh. based on a podcast, okay. based on a podcast. It's really interesting. What kind of uh, about a, character it's a are you real playing? guy. I play, uh, I play the, um, uh, the CEO of the hospital. Um, mm. where this, uh, it's a real, it's a true story of a guy who maimed and or killed like 30 people in Texas. Oh, wow. a terrible surgeon. It's a fascinating story. There's a, there's wow. a podcast called Dr. Death. It's really cool. Um, yeah. so all of that preparation I have to do, you know, on my own. I find it really, I mean, when I get on a set, it's very adrenalizing. I find that even if I'm doing a couple scenes by the end of the day, I'm sort of mentally exhausted right. because you, you don't have time to mess up. You don't have time to, that's what I love about plays. You get to bump into the furniture for a few weeks and sort of see where you're going to go. Often, you know, you, you, you do a scene, you go to lunch and you're like, oh, now I know what I want to do, you know, but it's already in the can and it's <laughs> over. So you don't have that opportunity. And then you rely on the editor to make you look right. Which brings me to a question I have. How do you, prepare for a complex character like what you're playing on the blacklist how, how do you go about uh creating and and that character well i first of all i just look at all the given circumstances all the things that people say about you even if not that everything that people say about you is true but you kind of know what, what do they say about you what do you think about yourself what is your relationship to each of these people what do you what is, what is your action what are you trying to play what are you trying to do to that person Make sure it's about the person that's in the room with you. Um, it's, uh, I like to think about, you know, their childhood. I like to think about their childhood or what are the sort of psychological things that have, that have, that have affected them. Um, you know, I don't, I guess I don't think human beings are born bad. You know, I think life kind of happens and, and you find the love in them? Yeah, or, yeah. or I find, well, I find the love in them, but I find perhaps where they didn't get the love that they needed, I suppose, um, which then makes them behave a certain way. Uh, it's interesting. I like when I read a script, you know, people say, well, how do you choose the roles that you want to do? I, I always like it when I read something and it kind of scares me a little bit. Like I, I, I could describe it as like your blood is rotating through your body, circulating through your body in a certain direction. And then suddenly I read something, oh, and then my blood starts going the other direction. <laughs> and I think, oh, this is kind of scaring me or I'm going to learn something or it's going to challenge me in some way or it's going gonna, it's gonna to challenge me and I'm going to have to kind of, you know, step up. And the kind of the challenge of it is kind of exciting to me, but it's terrifying too. It's kind of a good a good terrifying one. Okay, good so nerves. I'm, yeah, I'm going to put it. this out into the universe. So when, when somebody is going to make a movie about your life, who do you think you'd want to play you? <laughs> who would play me in my life? Correct. Hmm. Start thinking because it's going to happen. When I put things out into the universe. <laughs> my life. Um... I don't know. Obviously, some it, it depends on what part of me life my life you're going to be filming. I guess that's true. Your it's theater funny, days. I, I, I always feel kind of a. I mean, 
Kate Blanchett is such a wonderful actress. You know, I, I could, I should be so lucky to have her play me. You know, I think she's wonderful. We just put it out in the universe. You never <laughs> I'd know. To, I'd love mm -hmm. to play Kate Blanchett's sister or, you know, or whatever. I'll play her mother. I don't care. <laughs> that would be wonderful to see you in a film with her. I can well, see that. You'll come back for an interview another time and you'll be like, oh my gosh, it, it happened. happened. Yeah. <laughs> it happened. We put it out there. What are, what are some of the hardest things to navigate as an actress, uh, both when starting out in your career and once you're already established in your career? You know, it's so different for uh, my generation versus younger people. So much of the younger thing is about the social media stuff. and I. I mean, I'm barely on Facebook and I'm on Instagram and Twitter, but I don't know how to do it. So I don't do it. <laughs> just, I just really, <laughs> I put me. it over my head. Um, and I know that there's so much focus on that as a young actor. Um, that's all well and good, but you know, you have, you kind of have to have the goods to back it up. And I sometimes wish that, that younger, you know, the students that I have would focus more on the craft and more on the love of what it is that you're doing instead of the rewards or the dreams of, whatever it is they're dreaming about, um, you know, whether it's fame or fortune or whatever. I've always just loved the work. You know, I'll be out in, you know, New Jersey. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> to mention New Jersey and be doing, you know, a Chekhov play and happy as a clam. I was never um, incredibly ambitious. Like I didn't go to all the right parties. I didn't try to get in the, I mean, I was just always kind of doing my work. And then the work was coming to me, I think, because I sort of did a good job as I worked. And trying to, um, you know, maintain your integrity as far as the kind of jobs you take. They say a lot of times your career is all, also made up of the th things that you said no to. Uh, mm -hmm. Because you sort of say, I have a certain standard or certain level of thing that I want to do. Um, making those choices... Uh, Oh, what I find hard is going to those, you know, red carpet things. You know, finding the dress is so hard. <laughs> that takes up so much energy. I know you. You. You said. You said. You've. You've said before that you. Uh, you wished you had had uh, somebody training you in in those things. In the yeah, I mean, because at Yale, you know, we didn't pay attention to any of that. There was nothing about that. In fact, when I got out of school, you were supposed to be a theater actor. And if you went to TV, that was like considered selling out in a kind mm -hmm. of a negative way or, um, you know, so we kind of came out with this, we're going to be theater actors. And I, and I do love the theater and I try to do it as, you know, once a year at least to just kind of keep all those muscles going. Cause it is a very apples and oranges kind of, well, that's one of the things I learned on Blacklist is, is how small the performances can be and still read once you see it on TV. It's always amazing to me to watch the energy levels as far as stage versus screen versus right. small screen. You know, it's, um, it's a real lesson. Uh, I'm learning more and more about that. Like on the big screen, you know, you, you don't even want to move your head or your eyeballs without a reason. I mean, it's just, everything's just so powerful when you do something that I like, like that on the big screen, you know, versus on the stage, you've really got to reach, not only the other actor on the stage, but the back row of the balcony. It's a whole other, whole other ball game. And um, so watching people on the blacklist, being on a show again, where I'm a regular, where I can sort of learn week to week how to keep calibrating that. Um, yeah, navigating things as an actress. Uh, oh, how often? Yeah, it's, um, yeah. How often do you feel that uh, self-image keeps actors from breaking through? You mean their, their, their idea of themselves? Yes. Well, it's interesting, you know, um, having real confidence is really helpful. And I think for many, many years I was, um, you know, insecure. I was naive. I was scared. I was intimidated. I was second guessing. And then eventually, you know, like when I went to L.A. for a while, I always felt like I was trying to mold myself into something I thought they wanted. Mm -hmm. or what I kept getting feedback about, or I could be more like this. And, and then I just kind of went, you know what, I'm just going to go back to New York and do plays. and just really delve into my craft. 
and I got more solid in myself and more sure of myself. And then that reads, that was reading in the auditions, I think, uh, a sense of uh, self-possession or ownership of your craft and being strong about the choices you want to make. You know, sometimes you go into a, a casting director and they'll tell you to do something and you'll think, hmm, that's not my instinct. But you kind of capitulate because they're the person who's casting or you mm -hmm. think they know more about what the director is looking for. And yet I always kind of want to go, okay, I'll do it that way, but can you also send the one that, that I think, you know, should be sent? Because I kind of took a certain angle on it that's sort of unique or different. And maybe that's what the director is actually looking for. Mm -hmm. um, so in essence, once you started believing in yourself, everyone naturally just started believing in you as well, it sounds like. I don't know about people's belief in me. I don't really, <laughs> I have never no tabs on that, but um, it's nice to hear from all of you that I'm getting some. some <laughs> your mom's, your mom said something that I loved. She said, you just go in there and do your pieces. Don't worry about them. And I love that. It's, it's you, she was at the audition with you for the uh, Yale School of Drama in Chicago. And I know you were standing, you were wearing your corduroy pants, your white shirt, your buttoned all the way up with a red bow and all the girls were smoking cigarettes and doing yeah, dress completely different and you're just looking around and going and I know that feeling I've had I've that's happened to me and I, I've, I've and you're just like oh I, I did this is I don't know if I'm an actress so or if I'm gonna fit in and um, and your mom said that and I thought that was just so beautiful yeah. uh, she's just like uh, how did, how, uh, obviously you, you, you got in, but in a world that everybody's just trying to keep up, trying to, to do the norm, how do you set yourself apart from, from, from the norm? Hmm. I don't know that I, I don't know that I try to. Mm -hmm. Um, I think, as I said, more and more, I think I bring more and more of myself to the room. Mm -hmm. Whereas in the past, I would try to become something else or be more this or that. And now, I think I more go in with a lot more of myself, which I think reads well on, on screen especially. Mm -hmm. And I, I make strong choices with the material, I make really specific choices, really work on being super specific. Um, and I guess I just sort of think, you know, what's, what, what is mine will come to me. You know, I feel like roles come to me for a reason or if they don't, I'm always curious, you know, when I don't get a role, I ask my agent, who got it? Who got it? I want to know <laughs> what they were looking for, you know, and she'll tell me and I kind of go, huh, well, that's an interesting choice. And I'll understand why, or I mean, there's so many different reasons you get cast or not cast because it, it really rarely has anything to do with you. That's true. To do with how you match with another actor or, or just a per kind of particular type they're looking for, or um, so I really uh, I think I take it less and less personally when I don't get something because you know it was really helpful for a young actor to do is sit in on a casting session, you know, or be a reader for a casting director or sit on a on a theater audition process and you really see how subjective it is. And in many ways, as soon as the person walks in the door, you know. In some ways, you just know in that when they walk in and say hello, it's the weirdest thing. Then they do the work, and you're hoping, oh, I hope they're good. But there are these little unspoken, very uh, enigmatic things in the air that either make you cast someone or not. Right. And as I said, I think it's more and more about being uh, inside your own skin and being relaxed and being, um, in some ways, knowing what you have to offer as an individual, you know? I mean, I feel I've lived a long life and I've had a lot of experiences and I'm, I know some stuff and I want to bring that stuff with me in the room. You know, when I think as a young actor, I wanted to be like that shiny penny. You know, you want to be perfect. You want to go in and be perfect. Well, actually nobody's interested in your perfection. They're interested in your imperfection. They're interested in your humanity. And, and if you let that shine through, you know, 
sometimes I'll go into an audition just to talk about what happened to me on the subway because it kind of puts me in the moment mm. or it reveals something that is, that is not pre-planned. You know, it's not like I go in with like, oh, I'm going to say this and this and this about the script. It's more like, oh my God, this thing just happened to me. And, and so they, they can actually see your essence. They can see who you are. And also to realize that those people, those people auditioning you, want you to do well. And they want you to be the one that they want to hire. And they're rooting for you. Instead of feeling like it's some sort of gauntlet or some sort of judges panel, to really change that dynamic between what I think about them thinking about me, you know? It's like we're all just human beings. Because don't you find it strange? You, you audition for something and you're all like uptight. The next day you get it, you go to the first read through and everybody's friends and everybody's pals. <laughs> and yeah. it's like, well, what was the difference? Why not create that energy inside yourself when you go into the I audition? It. I love it. Somebody told me you want to go into the audition almost as if you picked up the phone and your agent said you got the job. So create that cellular thing happening in your body so you own it. It's your job. Ooh, a cellular visualization. Yeah. Then you yeah. go in and then you, and then you own it or you bring what you have to it. And either they like it or they don't, or they want it or they don't. But at least you brought your best game. You know? That must be an East Coast kind of attitude because we, ha we tend to have that attitude. I know over there in LA, no, I'm kidding. They're <laughs> <laughs> all laid back, but I mean, what, what made you choose the East Coast? <laughs> like, was it the blacklist uh, or you just? You mean to live on the East Coast? Yeah. Uh, well, it's probably because I went to Yale. I mean, I did get accepted at, at um, University of Washington in Seattle. They were doing a, a program uh, there. Um, but because I went to Yale, I guess it was already on the East Coast. And then, and then, when I, and I, then I got into Williamstown, sort of summer stock before my last couple of years at Yale. And then I got into American Repertory Theater in Boston. And then I got a Broadway show. I got the real thing with Jeremy Irons. So what was being, you know, your first thing is Broadway, right? So yeah. what did you do before you stepped out on stage and the curtain's about to go up? Did you get like nervous? What was your feeling? <laughs> I, was, I was so terrified. I didn't have time to get nervous. I rehearsed for, t for like two weeks and it had a revolving set. So you literally would finish one scene, go through a door and then the set would, would revolve and the dresser would grab you, rip your clothes <laughs> off, throw more clothes on you and shove you through another door. I mean, I didn't even know where I was when I was go through the door to go backstage because the thing was spinning. It was, it was really baptism by fire. It was crazy. <laughs> it was crazy. I learned a lot in those six months. Jeremy Irons taught me a lot. I had An incredible, lot. incredible yeah. actor. Wonderful you actor. Yeah. You I also worked with young actor you know, <laughs> habit things that were terrible <laughs> once i my first actual uh, professional play was with christopher walken i was just gonna was say yeah, i was yeah what was that like <laughs> he used to, i was as a young actress i was playing sasha who's in love with ivana and so i kept touching chris in rehearsal like touching him and he go lila you touch me again i'm gonna have to hit you <laughs> Oh, wow. And, once, and he hated the sound of the air conditioner during performances. And so once we were in a performance and he looked at me kind of cross-eyed, he heard this, heard this sound, he kind of held up his finger like, I'll be right back. And he walked off the stage and he went up to the stage manager's desk and I told you not to turn on the you know, air conditioner. And she goes, no, it's the rain on the roof. So he was, <laughs> he was, he was crazy. I love him. He's crazy. So funny. He, at the end of rehearsals, he'd look at me and say, this is going to be a disaster. <laughs> <laughs> I could just picture him doing that. Right. That's hilarious. Oh, God. Tell us about uh, the, the public theater, uh, the Apple family. The Apple family it's, play? Yeah, yeah through, through Zoom. We started them 10 years ago. 10 years ago, for four years in a row, we did a new Richard Nelson Apple family play. And I did all four of those. And then we filmed them for local PBS just in the tri-state area. And that was a wonderful experience. That was one of my dreams is to, to actually film a play that you'd actually worked on for a really long time. I thought, oh, that would be so special. And so that dream came true. Um, 
So yeah, so we did those four. And then he wrote two other series uh, about two other families in Rhinebeck, the Michaels and the Gabriels. And then when he decided to do the Zoom thing, which is the first play uh, written for Zoom, not a play reading on Zoom, but a play for Zoom, uh, Richard wrote to me and said, hey, do you want to be a part of this? And I'm absolutely. And we've done three of them. The third one's on now. You can go to YouTube and get it at, um, you go to YouTube and type in incidental moments of the day and it'll come up or you can go to the applefamilyplays.com and there's a link there and that'll be on i think until early november it only plays for a limited amount of time and uh those have been wonderful those have been just a godsend as far as staying creative during this time it's been really nice to be in rehearsal. so they do them yearly uh this was just we just did three you know mm -hmm. since the pandemic began uh, but the first four years, 10 years ago, we did four years in a row. Yeah. And I don't know, maybe he'll write more. I don't know if there's an election coming up. You know, he tends to like to write around these big events. And um, so we're all hoping he'll come up with another one. Now, you also said you, you're interested in exploring different avenues of, of the entertainment industry. Uh, if you could... Uh, uh, produce something, write a, write a play, or, or what, what would you choose to do that something you haven't I, I done yet? I, I think I'd maybe like to adapt a, a novel into a screenplay, uh, but that's all, you know, very speculative. Um, I think I like, I love directing. I think, you know, sometimes when you're on a TV show, I'm not a series regular on a blacklist or any of that, but when you're a series regular and you have a hit show, sometimes you can work it into your contract where you get to direct an episode. And I would love to do that because I think that would be um, really interesting. I mean, I'd have, obviously have to learn a lot about the camera and I would re rely on the DP a lot for that sort of thing. But perhaps it would behoove me to trail a director, you know, maybe even on the blacklist, maybe I could ask to trail someone uh, and just sort of be aware of what those, I think that's a really intense job. I mean, it's right. <laughs> every day, all day. And uh, what, you know, the location scouting is all about, or I, I would like to direct. Um, and I think I've made a joke in the past about being a good producer because I can see where money is hemorrhaging, you know. <laughs> the well, immigrant oh, in you. Oh, yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know. I mean, I suppose one will have to segue into other things. Um, I just love acting, you know. This pandemic is kind of a trip because I don't have any other skills, so I'm kind of <laughs> I'm at a loss here. Oh, you have you have a you have a lot of skills, and I know you're working yes. uh, with a theater in, in New Jersey as well. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't know if anyone's told you this, but you're very soothing. I'm uh, soothing. You're very soothing, and you have. Mm. I was listening to you, you know when you've been talking. You're very passionate about what you do. It's very clear. You're in love with your career, your business. It, it's it's beautiful. It's beautiful. It's you're you're very um. I want to say old school. That that your your belief system, where you come from, because of the training, is is mm. is just from the earth, and it's it's so real. You'd make an incredible incredible uh, coach and teacher, and I don't know if you've ever been told that. But I know you you do some of it, but uh, yeah, it's so easy to listen to you and to hear the advice and the stories that you're telling and i'm sure a lot of actors uh get a lot that work with you a lot from it oh well i hope so and i you know i get i get invested mm -hmm. in them too you know I, I don't kind of just walk in and walk out i really i think about them and i think about their future and what their capabilities are and where where i can help them because Sometimes it's a very easy adjustment. Sometimes, I mean, Uta Hagen told me that too, once. She said that she has never written off anybody in her acting classes. Like, oh, that person will never be an actor. She said there can be something that happens to a person or a life experience or something just goes click and suddenly that person can, can act. And I just love that she always had faith in everyone's ability to, to have a breakthrough or to find their way or, or at least to find... Uh, more of their own voice. You know, sometimes in my classes, I have 
uh, older people who have had other careers and now they're retired and they want to become an actor, you know, as a, as a hobby. And I really just enjoy watching them, you know, whether they're a good actor or not, I like watching them find more of themselves mm. and their more of their freedom in their own self-expression, which I think can, can um, help out anybody really psychologically and spiritually and, and, um, you know, so many women of, uh, well, generations before me, you know, have been so kind of clamped down or had to play certain roles or unable to really express themselves or always capitulating to their husband or whatever. It's just great to see those ladies kind of come out and want to, ah, you know, <laughs> I enjoy that part too. <laughs> do you meditate? You, you see, you, you. Oh, what do you do to, to ground yourself to center? Because uh, yeah, no, I noticed by by things that you've said, the spiritual, you've you've alluded to certain things. So I'm wondering, do do you, are, do you have a practice, a, a a morning routine that you do? Or well, um, I used to do a lot of yoga. Like in my 40s, I did a lot of yoga, like almost too much. It was just kind of taking over. I get so zenned out that I wouldn't really be kind of hungry for acting. <laughs> I remember going to see my therapist and she go, Lila, don't come to therapy after yoga. You're too blissed out. <laughs> like we're not getting any work done here. Um, but uh, in the morning I, I listen to um, a friend of mine is a Christian scientist, not a Scientologist, but a Christian scientist. Mm -hmm. And there's a little daily lift thing that I listen to. Uh, the church I go to is a Presbyterian church, so I kind of read a little thing they send out. And if Deepak Chopra has got a little free meditation going on, then I'm I'm there. I'm always there for that. Oh, I'm going to have to make that happen. Yeah, he does those <laughs> gonna, uh, tw gonna... 21 days. Yes, I do those, and I do them religiously. That's and every time there's not one, I'm a little depressed. I mean, I bought a few of them, so I have them, you know, at the ready. But, uh, yeah, I'd like to meditate and I like to uh, work out a little bit you know right now I'm not going to the gym obviously I don't I don't feel safe in a gym but my building has a little gym in the basement which I think I'm going to start going to you can sign up and you go in there one at a time and um, so but as far as I would like to study you know TM transcendental meditation I really like I would like to get a little deeper into that because I think um, I think it's you know it's that I think it's almost like the same as prayer in a way, you know, it's that silence that we in this crazy world, there's so much noise. Oh my God. And with technology, there's so much noise, all your emails and your Twitters and your this and that. There's no time where we sit quietly. And I think whether you believe in God or not, I think that's where in that silence, some, something gets connected. And I think we as a society really are lacking making that space available to ourselves. And it's really, really important. I think it's really important. And I, I think agree. it you shows know. it. It shows it in your quotes. I don't know if you realize, there's a lot of quotes that you have out on the internet. Oh, really? And I actually, <laughs> I have a couple, like I've had them in my books for, a, you know, a little. Oh my goodness. And I'm what just like, seeing? <laughs> there's, there's a lot of them. I mean, if, if we share a screen after this, when we shut off, I'll show you. All you have to do is type in your name, quotes, and oh. you'll see things that you've said and they're so inspirational and it's, it's amazing. Like that may be your next thing. Like, you know, the whole meditation, teaching it, I, I see that coaching, but like, did you ever wonder like what your life would be like if you stayed singing? Well, I do sing a little bit. I sing at benefits. Uh, I'm not a Broadway singer by any stretch of the imagination. <laughs> I do not have a Broadway belting voice. I've done one musical professionally, which I did in Pasadena, of all places, at the uh, Pasadena Playhouse. I did a musical called Dangerous Beauty, and I played the mother to the lead girl, Jenny Powers. She's amazing. And I had a song, and I didn't get booed off the stage, so I think that was, that was, a, that was trying to challenge myself by doing a musical. But I do like to sing at Benefits. And I do like to sing, you know, the folk music. And I've been trying to put a cabaret thing together, you know, on and off over the years. And I've sung, you know, I've sung at 54 Below a couple songs. And I've sung at Feinstein's. And, you know, I dabble. I dabble in the singing. But I really, 
would like to do more of it. I really would. I would so like tell us about this cabaret. Do you dance? <laughs> Have you I had do. dance? No, no. I'm always the person in the back of the dance class <laughs> going <laughs> and feeling like a total idiot. I don't know what it is. I guess I, because I didn't dance that much as a kid, so I don't have the vocabulary. You know, it's like a language. Mm-hmm. You, know, you know, it's a language that people put it together and boom, you've got it. Um, it's not that I'm not uncoordinated. I could, learn a, I could learn a dance, but I'm not the person who can just go out there and like do it. Uh, it would take some work. But I think um, the cabaret thing, I think I would like to tell stories, you know, about my life and tie some songs together and, and have it really span a lot of different material, you know, like folk and maybe even some Latvian folk songs and some Broadway stuff and some standards and really have a real kind of smorgasbord of stuff. I don't know. We'll see. We'll see. All, everything is possible. I believe in yeah. possibility. Even yeah, the impossible possible. is possible. Uh, <laughs> Layla, thank you so much for taking the time and gifting us with, with your time and, and coming in to talk with us. You're an incredible person, woman, actress, uh, spirit. And um, I have a few questions before we go. I just like to ask, um, what, what is one thing you would say to your younger self with all the experience you've had right now in your life? If you were looking at a younger version of yourself, what would you say to her now? Hmm. Believe in yourself. Trust, trust yourself, you know? You're getting me for clamped. No. <laughs> <laughs> and what, what, would you, what would you say to actors right now out there, uh, still hopeful of, of a career despite these changing times? Oh. Uh, how, what, what advice would you give them to expand in a contracting uh, market right now in the industry? Well, I think a, a lot of our work is, you know, relationships. So if you, for example, my relationship to the Shakespeare Theater of New Jersey, you know, having those kinds of groups, those kinds of colleagues, those kind of people that you work with a lot, you know, my Apple family thing, it's wonderful to have a home, so to speak, or a group of people that you relate to and you can speak the same language, you know, about your work. Uh, I love working in Jersey Shakes because we've all done, you know, 10, 12 plays up there. And when we're in rehearsal, we have so much fun and we could just kind of jump to the chase and we're all speaking the same word, you know, language. Um, I don't know. I know there's all this stuff about staying, you know, present in these venues. Um, I would say, you know, you can use this opportunity to, to maybe work with a coach and uh, really focus on stuff that's you know people that never want to work on stuff they're not good at it's no of course it's not fun to work on stuff you're not good at because you're not good at it why would you want to do it <laughs> but it's an opportunity to really stretch right now because nobody's nobody's watching that so you can really grow during this time you know and um also i really you know i'm a big believer in you know th- this is our this is our vessel this is our instrument and to respect that and not to abuse it you know and and um, for me, it's almost kind of like there's something sort of um, sacred to me about what we do as actors. You know, we right. really can fill the shoes of other people and as a result, make, make people compassionate about other people. I love playing characters, for example, like in the, at the end of Act One, they hate you. At the end of Act Two, <laughs> I love you. I love that because then you change their mind, you know, you show who that person really is deep down. Even if you didn't like them in the beginning, like what's wrong with that person? And then at the end, you just, you, you, have, a, you have a heart and you have a place in your heart for that person too. And I feel like we are like, you know, the bearers of, of that for humanity. So I, it's so important to keep the theater alive and to keep stories alive and, and to keep telling those stories so that we, we don't get isolated and, um, and separated from each other. We need to really be reaching out to each other right now. So true. Thank you. Well, we, uh, we, we definitely, you definitely are uh, winning, winning hearts with your role as Katerina, despite how ruthless she is. I, uh, the, the very tender side of her when she uh, tells her daughter, I love you. 
and you see those those tears in her eyes. Um, it's incredible. I can't wait to see what you do with season eight. I can't wait to see what you do with everything you've got going on in your life. Um, There's a film coming out called uh, A Call to Spy. A Call to Spy. And it's a really beautiful film. Very well done by Lydia Pilcher. A Call to Spy. A Call to Spy. Be on the lookout for that. And uh, definitely be on the lookout for Lila Robbins. She is Hollywood's one to watch. Uh, thank you so much, everybody, for joining us. Thank you, Lila. Thank, Thank you, you, Michelle Mupo, our wonderful host, and my lovely co-host, Heather Hernandez. You can uh, watch our show on mupoentertainment.com. And uh, until next time, this is Hollywood with Mupo and Friends, and we are over and out.